Good evening, everyone. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books, and Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We are so excited to be here once again with Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz in conversation with Dina Gilio Whitaker for a discussion of the 10th anniversary edition of An Indigenous People's History of the United States which was the first history of the United States told from the perspective of indigenous peoples. And we were just talking in the green room and, um, you know, Roxanne came to Karis uh, for, for the initial publication of this book. It doesn't seem like 10 years has flown by, but it, but it has. Mm -hmm. And so we're very honored to get to celebrate this book again. Um, it is particularly timely. We were talking in the green room about, the Atlanta Stop Cop City movement, and also um, the current struggles for freedom in Gaza and Palestine, and for all of the many ways that um, our environment and the world um, speak to the need to understand this history, right? We need to understand um, what is happening in the U.S. and how it connects to the rest of the world. So um, your work has been a tool for so many people to get grounded in understanding um, where we come from. And so Thank you for taking the time to be here and for um, bringing this book out again in a 10th edition so that new people can discover it. Um, so I want to first introduce Dina, who is of the Colville Confederated Tribes. She's a descendant of the Colville Confederate Tribes. She's a lecturer of American Indian Studies at California State University San Marcos and an independent educator and advisor in American Indian environmental policy and community engagement. Her scholarship and community-engaged work focuses on environmental justice and traditional knowledge in the context of tribal sovereignty and nationalism, as well as critical sports studies in the realm of surf culture and professional surfing. She also brings these ideas into her work as an award-winning journalist, having written for many high-profile publications, including the Los Angeles Times, DR Magazine, Indian Country Today Media Network, Time.com, High Country News, and many others. Dina's most recent book is Beacon Presses, As Long as Grass Grows, Indigenous Environmental Justice from Colonization to Standing Rock. And she is currently under contract with Beacon Press for two new works. She is also a co-editor of a new collection from Cambridge University Press's Elements series on Indigenous environmental research. So welcome to you. So glad to have you here. And of course, Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz is a New York Times bestselling author grew up in rural Oklahoma in a tenant farming family. She's been active in the international indigenous movement for more than four decades and is known for her lifelong commitment to national and international social justice issues. Dunbar Ortiz is the winner of the 2017 Lannan Cultural Freedom Prize and is the author of, or editor of many books, including An Indigenous People's History of the United States, which was a is the re recipient of the 2015 American Book Award. She lives in San Francisco. You can connect with her at reddirtsite.com or on Twitter at rdumbaro. Um, and we would love for folks to shout out in the chat where they are watching from. Um, we love to know where you are in the world and uh, want to let you know if you would like to ask questions, you may do so at any time. We'll gather them and I'll pop back on at the very end to help facilitate that part. Um, but without further ado, uh, Thank you both so much for being here. We're very honored to get to celebrate an Indigenous people's history of the United States. Okay, thanks, ER. I will get started, and uh, I guess I'll start by saying, Roxanne, it's great to see you again and to be in conversation with you. Um, this is something for the uh, for the audience who doesn't know. Roxanne and I uh, go back a ways. We co-authored a book together in 2015, and uh, and, and that was the book, All the Real Indians Died Off and 20 Other Myths About Native Americans. And that was the book that followed right on the heels of an indigenous people's history. And so I had the the amazing pleasure and experience of being able to co-author that book with Roxanne and, uh, and go on a book tour. We went on a book tour together. Um, so we Ooh. were on... We were on on the road for a couple of months, and it was a pretty interesting experience. Especially, I think the highlight of that was, um, oh, the day of the election, huh. the, that sad, sorry day of the election in twenty sixteen. <laughs> um, 
but that's a conversation for another time. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to start, Roxanne, by by asking you about uh, this new edition, which I've got right here in my hands. And um, my question, my first question for you is, uh, is uh, it, has this book been revised in any way since its first edition? Thanks so much, Gina. And I just thinking of the happy memory of our road trip and uh, also the Standing Rock Uprising was going on at that time, which is very inspiring. Um, yeah, well, it's uh, the, the content of the text is unchanged. You know, the body of the book uh, is only a front matter. Um, there's a preface by Raoul Peck, uh, who uh, used the book for his uh, four-part HBO series, Exterminate All the Brutes. And um, there's then... Uh, a fairly long introduction, a new, inter well, I think we call it, yeah, I think we call it an introduction, new introduction, mm -hmm. uh, where I tell about the, you know, the writing of the book, and I can um, tell about, you know, how it came about and everything, if you like, but uh, so it, uh, and then we added also at the end, uh, quite a few new sources, like native authors, that have come out oh, okay. since 2014. It was very frustrating because mm -hmm. I would love to have had all those books, you know, at the uh, at the time I was writing some really extraordinary ones, and they're still still coming out. I mean, since we this went to press, we have uh, Ned Black Hawk's uh, wonderful new book uh, from uh, uh, from Harvard, and um, mm -hmm. so it's. Um, it's, there's really a renaissance, I think, of, of Native literature. And I, I really, um, my point, you know, with, with this book was to um, really tell the history of the United States from the experience of Native people. And um, it's not dumbed down, but it's also, you know, uh, made it so that it was uh, digestible. You know, that it wasn't so foreign because you know, Indians are treated like uh, people from Mars or something, you know, inscrutable and undefinable and people not understanding what nations are instead of individual native people. Uh, there's bo they're both, they're individuals, but they're also part of a, a nation and uh, 500 nations. So... This is, um, you know, it was, uh, uh, I'm really glad to see the new edition come out and reach new people. I appreciate Beacon doing that. Yeah, I mean, it's really amazing that the book, I mean, it's 10 years old and it, and it hasn't missed a beat at all. I mean, it seems like this oh. book is as popular as ever and still so widely read and respected um that i i i i see why you know beacon made uh made a big deal of reissuing it and uh and with i really love the the intro by ralph peck and i want to get to that in a minute but before i do i wanted to ask you about something that you have uh have often said in the past uh, and and it sticks with me and I want you to address it and and it's that you have acknowledged that it was only you could never have published this book while you were still a professor while you were still teaching and still in the academy and um, and I think there's that's really compelling for me and I'd like to for the listeners to to hear about that yeah, thanks for asking about that because uh, it was. I really worked hard at you know I was trained in history, which is a very traditional training uh, that you don't bring yourself into uh, things. You don't uh, 
personalize it. You don't have an opinion, you know, and they pretend that everything is totally objective mm -hmm. based on the documents, based on the sources. Of course, they choose mm -hmm. their source. You know, it's a it's an entrapment to not go outside the parameters that are already set by the history field that you just don't, you know, you don't go outside. The, if you want to have a career, you know, in, in a history department at a major university. So I, I was trained in that and uh, good at it, you know, and my first book was my dissertation that is uh, kind of, you know, when I adapted it to a, pu a published book, I, you know, I uh, made it more readable because it was dissertations are always very, they have to be, you know, you, yeah. To get your PhD. So it's a kind of a straight jacket. And what I decided to do, and uh, it was actually in the early 90s when I said, I am going to try to write literary style rather than, you know, I don't need any books. I don't need, you know, I had tenure. I had, there was not nothing more I could, let's say, reach for with another academic book. And, um, I actually went to, uh, I got an MFA in, in uh, creative writing. Uh, I decided I needed help <laughs> with this because I, and I did, you know, at those seminars, um, all the others, you know, say, no, oh, you know, I don't even know what you're talking about. You know, it's it's like gar garbly, you know, it's it's like code or something, you know, the references. And these were young uh, young uh, young people in the seminar. So uh, if I brought up things, you know, jargon or whatever from my generation, they said, well, well, what does that mean? And we haven't heard that, you know, anything put that way. So it was just, um, it was really magical. It was harsh. I mean, it was hard, you know, it was really hard to let go. And um, so I... Uh, start. I wrote three memoir, literary memoirs, and I put a lot of history into them. You know, I made myself, uh, you know, sort of put myself into a historical setting. Red Dirt, Growing Up Okie, you know, in Oklahoma, and then um, Outlaw Woman, where I got involved in the women's movement, helped start it, in fact. And the 60s, you know, the revolutionary 60s. And then Blood on the Border, my uh, decade um, in Nicaragua, you know, uh, um, opposing the Contra War and trying to get uh, information out. And um, so in doing that, I, I couldn't go back to the other way of writing. And so I, had, I, I wouldn't have thought of writing this book you know, this Beacon book, it wasn't in my mind. In fact, I was writing, I was trying to write a um, a literary book on uh, uh, the um, Bendit Queen that I grew up with, Belle Starr uh, in Oklahoma. She was a, a, ran with the James Gang, Jesse James and all, robbing banks. And, they went to prison and everything. This is my hero. And the more I delved into it, I, they were they were Confederate guerrillas. You know, here I was, my whole childhood, um, my most admired person, woman, was a Confederate guerrilla. You know, her family owned slaves. So when I researched it, you know, I so I I haven't ever gotten back to that book. I did a a pretty long article for a unknown journal. Um, I probably won't get back to it, but it was really, it was mind boggling, you know, cause I still held that in my mind and so do others in Oklahoma, you know, so I, it's kind of a pouring uh, water on, you know, <laughs> it's like, um, uh, sort, of, sort of disappointing to people to learn the truth. You know, uh -huh. but anyway, I just put that aside and, and then started and 
uh, you know, our, our editor, uh, Gaitra, who's now president of Beacon Press, I kept trying to back out of it and get someone else to write it because I said, I, I can't do it. So I really struggled. And um, it was published in, yeah, in 2014. So it was really four years. Once I, you know, I said, uh, someone asked me in one of my presentations, how long it took me to write the book? And I said, four years. And they said, four years? It says they saw me just writing constantly. Four years? It's not that big a book. I said, no, I was mostly not writing it, you know, <laughs> uh, trying to, or rewriting until I got a final version, you know. <laughs> well, and that, and I mean, that doesn't even, a, there's all the time, I mean, ha, so much of writing is the non-writing part of it too, right? It's the research yeah. and um, the reading and the thinking yeah. about it and the waiting for right. the, or the waiting for it to form in your mind. Uh, but what about the content? So, so you, it sounds like you had to re- relearn a new style or learn a new style of writing, train yourself in this different kind of language. But what about the content? So the, the content, it really, as a historic history text, it focuses on this framework that we call settler colonialism, but that's a fairly new, that's a fairly new framework for historians. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think that's one of the things that makes it different. Uh, what about that? Do you, and that's one part of the question, but the other part of the question that I'm curious about is if you see settler colonialism as an analysis really starting to, to take root and to become something that will not, that will, that's not trendy, that, that sticks for historians. Yeah, it, it, it was fairly new. Um, there have been some things written and there was actually a settler colonial journal out of Canada that had started. But what the first stage of how I got to that was I, I struggled for two years to, you know, I was writing and then, you know, throwing it away and tearing it up and starting again. And I know from writing, you know, the previous books that I had to find a, um, a string, you know, that goes through the whole book. Otherwise, it's just this happened and that happened. Mm -hmm. and it's very boring, you know, like a textbook. And um also, you know, in my two years of uh, at uh, getting the MFA, I, I learned that, you know, I really learned you have to have a, a through line. Now, what is that? What is the core of it? Mm. And once I, I read, um, I read John Grenier's book on the, you know, the from the colonial period to uh, 1812. Um, and he's a, the first he's way a, of war, uh, er, right? Yeah, the first way of war. Yeah. And he's a professor of history at the Air Force University College in um, Colorado. And so he's a military historian. I said, that's it. It's military. The first hundred years of the U.S. was nonstop war to create settler colonialism. And so the, the settlers themselves are like everyone a soldier, you know, that they're, they're armed and they're, it's really hard. You know, I wrote this book loaded about the second amendment that, that I, I have a very hard time convincing anyone that, that they were heavily armed. They want to say, Oh, you know, no one had guns in their flintlocks. Well, they killed a lot of native people. But of course, you know, the usual thing is Native people died only of diseases, you know, they weren't killed. Well, you know, people do starve when they're put in camps, you know, when they're rounded up and put in camps. And 
So that that gave me the through line was militarism. So it's really, it could be called a military history of the United States, but that would that would take John Grenier's title. <laughs> You know, but I I quote him a lot. I think it's a brilliant, it's an absolutely brilliant book. And it was a lifesaver for me because it was, um, it, it just, it immediately just uh, rang a bell. You know, the book came out while I was writing. So, um, you know, it, it, it really uh, was a very important source for me, understanding myself that how to, you know, um, how how to present that, how to present it as with a through line, mm -hmm. and um, and then the other key element was the doctrine of discovery, you know, that also which was newly being discussed, um, and the whole Columbus thing and. Uh, the book after that, Not a Nation of Immigrants, has a lot more even, you know, about uh, mm -hmm. Columbus. So do you think settler colonialism as an analysis is here to stay? Well, yeah, look at what is happening right now in Israel, the settler state. They want the whole place, you know. I mean, they come, they come and say, oh, we just want this farmland, you know here on the East Coast, and then they say, oh, no, you know, we want more land, more land. So a settler colonialism is, is rare among col colonialism. Usually they're colonial uh, agents uh, that and armies that control the people like in Africa, Asia, Latin America. But Northern Ireland, you know, was a, a settler colonial uh, back in the 16th, 17th century. So I, you know, I began uh, with that, where this comes from, where settler uh, colonialism comes from. And fortunately, there were a couple of really good books that had come out um, uh, by historians on settler colonialism. And uh, um, it, you know, I had, I had the sources. So that, that was, um, you know, I think it it did it did really it was something new in a book that got published and really got read. Uh, there had been some articles and all, and um, it's it's probably the main thing that people ask me about. You know, that really catches them that it's something new that they hadn't. I mean, settler colonialism isn't new, but knowing about it, you know, understanding it. And um, I think, you know, my, um, my involvement in the anti-apartheid movement, I learned a great deal about settler colonialism in South Africa. It was unusual, you know, the Afrikaners, the Dutch, the Dutch Protestants, uh, fanatic evangelicals, uh, just like the United States <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. founded. Um, uh, so that... That was, um, you know, that was, those are some of the elements I think that were new in, in approaching uh, what happened with Native people in the United States. Well, and, it's, such an, it's such an important intervention. I mean, I can't, I can't, uh, so when I was in school and as an undergrad, studying Native American studies, uh, which was rooted in, you know, col in colonial, really kind of more post-colonial uh, theory. But it was at that juncture before we were talking, we, I didn't read anything about settler colonialism until I got to grad school. And so yeah. it was like sort of that in between, it was like just before uh, settler colonialism was really, you know, in Patrick Wolf's, you know, famous essay, you know, settler colonialism right. and the elimination of the native before it became so, uh, so widely read. But, uh, but it really yeah. makes it answers so many questions. It puts into perspective uh, the the kinds of experiences that 
indigenous people have that are different from what happened in places like Africa and Asia, Asia, as you, as you said. And, uh, and I think uh, that seems to be a really major turn in, in the, the historical, you know, space academically. So I think that it really can't be overstated how important that that is and how you brought, brought that perspective in the book. Yeah, you know, I think that um, the terminology is just uh, so important to it. That, you know, when I, I was always interested in the land and my doctoral dissertation was on the history of land tenure in New Mexico. And I didn't have the language of settler colonialism at that time. I mean, the new edition of the book, the revised edition, has a, you know, at the, at the end, does bring that in. But initially, in 1974, when I was writing, I, um, I, was, I was seeing these three colonialisms, you know, the, the Spanish coming in, colonizing the Pueblos, and then they drove them out. You know, the Pueblos drove them out, uh, the Spanish in the um, 16, uh, in 1698. And then they came back, you know, with a bigger army and, and brought settlers to take the land. So that was settler colonialism was that, you know, second uh, Spanish uh, entrada, as they call it. Mm-hmm. And they're still very proud of it. I mean, it's still a thing in um, New Mexico is the, the Hispano settlers think that is their God-given land. And but much more contested really, now. Yeah, definitely much more contested. contested but there are still, and younger people, younger, most, many younger Hispanos, Hispanas, um, uh, absolutely, you know, the ones who teach at UNM, for instance, they have learned that and they teach it. And they're very effective because they know it from the inside. You know, I mean, they, they, um, they, um, uh, like me, you know, I have this double vision uh, as well because I, I mean, my dad was a tenant farmer. He never owned land, but he wanted to. <laughs> And his dad had, I mean, he grew up with land. They just lost it. And um, he was, you know, because I, so I knew, you know, just from my own past, reviewing it. Uh, so it's funny, you know, when you're writing, you learn from yourself. You learn, you learn, people don't think you already know all these things, but you learn while you write, you know, on research. It's a very dynamic process. It's not like you have all this knowledge and you're just, you know, writing it all down. No, no, that's exactly right. And that's one one thing I've discovered is that uh, writing a book is you want to learn something in, inside and out, you write about it. And, yeah. uh, and you know, especially in a book like Treatment. So um, <clears throat> I wanted to... Uh, I'm thinking right now about it, it, one of the things that's so important that's happened since this book was first published in 2014, of course, was uh, Ral Peck and, uh, and exterminate, all, exterminate All the Brutes. And for uh, the, those in the audience who may not be aware of this is, uh, is that uh, the, the HBO, uh, HBO, it's on HBO Max. Um, the book was adapted alongside two other books by the the you know celebrated filmmaker Raoul Peck into a four part series. And so um, I wanted to. I remember, I, w- I remember when we first talked about that, and I think you and I, I had picked you up at the airport. You'd come into LA. It was for it was for the LA Book Festival, and I remember you yeah. talking about how you got called like out of the blue. You got a phone call from Ralph Peck, 
And, and he said, Hi, this is Raul Peck. And, and I think you were kind of like, didn't believe it at first, <laughs> uh, but he was somebody that you knew who he was because you were, because you're such a film, you're kind of a film buff. And, and so yeah. you, you know, had already knew who he was and had this great respect for him. And so here he is calling you up on the phone and telling <laughs> you, you that, you know, he had read your book and he was blown away by it and he wants to make it into a film. And so um, talk about that a little bit and, uh, and what that experience was like for you. Yeah, he, uh, he had three books, you know, he already had mm -hmm. uh, that uh, uh, Exterminate All the Brutes, that, that book, and uh, which was about, about uh, mostly about Africa, you know, colonialism in Africa and um, uh, and a, then a Haitian historian book on uh, well Haiti and you know the the um, uh, colonization of uh, the the revolution <clears throat> of Haiti you know that drove out the colonizers uniquely and they never were able to come back um, so he, um, it's, it's the first time, and, you know, it's the book that made him do it. He, he didn't set out with um, dealing with North America because he, he, didn't, he didn't know. I mean, he's a Haitian. He had lived in New York, but had driven a taxi, you know, while he was trying to become a filmmaker. But he didn't know this history. And when he read it, he said, well, this is, you know, a part of it. And it's the first time of any, anything I know of, you know, any uh, a film or series or even books uh, back then that saw the United States as a colonizing power. Because the United States is a great democracy, a republic, a, you know, it saves people in the world, you know, but, but that, you know, my book goes, it has that militarism throughout, you know, the hundred years war and uh, war, you know, unending ever since. Uh, mostly proxy wars now, but U.S. is still at war sending the weapons you know, uh, to Palestine and to um Ukraine and other places um, that don't make the news. So uh, he was, yeah, he was, uh, he said, I want to use your book. And uh, then I ended up, because the other two authors who were friends of his, they died, you know, while he was, after he had option their books. Um, mm -hmm. they, they both died. So and they were both younger than me, but I lived on. And so he kind of drafted me uh, and actually paid me some um, to uh, help with the, with, the, uh, uh, with the script. And I had never dealt with a script. You know, you have to say a, a whole chapter uh, in my book. He would say, could you make this into three sentences? I said, how can I do that? Every part of it is essential. But for the film, it's going to show, you know, so the narration is, uh, you know, is, is simply uh, a, a, an introduction. Because documentaries that are all talk, talk, talk are not very interesting. So... It was an unusual documentary series where there was actual action. There was even some acting. It was a hybrid. Um, so he actually taught me how to, um, he was off in his hometown in some uh, remote place in Haiti, you know, where, where he grew up and his grandmother's house and, uh, writing and uh, having me go over the script, you know, and, and work on it. So I certainly didn't become an expert on that, you know, 
but it was an interesting way of working. And to see my own work, um, uh, you know, kind of in film was just, you know, it was kind of ma like magic because it, what he did with it. Um, so it was, uh, it, uh, I, I think people can still watch this on all, um, oh, yeah. on HBO Max. Uh, it's worth getting that 30 day free subscription. And if you don't want to sign up to it, you don't have to, but you get a month free on HBO Max and watch it because it's really still, you know, it's really important and it, it's, it fits so well with, uh, you know, with my book, uh, sort of bringing it to life. Yeah, it's really an amazing series. It's the most, I think it's the most hard hitting documentary ever done on American history, yeah. um, by far. Uh, I mean, it's it's a gut punch. That that's really like the the thing that the the term that comes to me and others, you know, who see it. It's just a gut punch because it's so unflinching uh, in in its perspective and the way that he weaves together, uh, you know, the three books from Sven Lindquist and Michelle Trio and you. And, uh, and, but it's also visually stunning because of um, the, the graphics, you know, the animation that goes with it. Yeah. Uh, he, he it, it's just, uh, there's so, it's such an, a, a brilliant weaving of these different histories and these different colonialisms together. Uh, I will mention also there is uh, a, study guide, a discussion guide that goes with the film that I co-authored with a colleague of mine. Yes, that's uh, right. And I was honored to, to do that. And, uh, and it lives on the website of that, uh, the series, um, Exterminate All the Brutes. But, uh, but I, how was it, what was the experience like working with, with Ralph for you? Uh, as somebody who was probably a fan, fair to say, was it fair? Is it fair yeah, to say you were a I, fan? I was a big fan, even of his early. You know, he did a documentary in nine. I think his first uh, film was uh, in 1989, and it was a black and white film on Lumumba. And I've always been interested in you know the assassination of Lumumba. He was such an important leader you know in africa and uh so many of them got assassinated but he was he was one of the earliest and one of the most um just a person who couldn't possibly be uh a sellout you know i mean by the imperial powers making deals with him and so they killed him and um so he he's kind of haunted by Lumumba. So it's a black and white film. He made two other films after that about Lumumba. Uh, but I had seen that, and then I had seen um, not all of his films played in the United States, uh, and I think only one at that time had played on uh, television, which was a James Baldwin, I Am Not Your Negro which most people know him by because um, because it was on PBS, a wonderful film, you know, and a documentary. And um, uh, so he did, he, he sent me links to all of his films to watch, to see his um, way of doing things. He's a unique documentary filmmaker. He usually, um, puts together, you know, real scenes of acting along with, uh, you know, researching and getting all kinds of film footage that is just, you know, pretty amazing uh, that what they find. I think he has a, a little crew of people just researching all the time to dig up every, <laughs> everything and, and then, you know, present it to him, you know, as, his next film. He's made about five more documentaries 
what is that, you know, that, uh, wow. that are, are really good. You can look on his website and see all the, all the films. Wow. And yeah. So he, he did one on, um, uh, sharecropper family and, uh, in North Carolina, you know, uh, that, that was on, I think it was on PBS. It showed here. It was, but he's constantly, you know, constantly making films, but that was his big, you know, that four part series, I think still is outstanding. And mm. just the fact that, um, you know, people pre presented with the United States as a colonizing power. You know, I have that in the book about uh, um, Obama <clears throat> when he went to visit um, right after his election. He went to visit, uh, uh, he was interviewed, he was in the Middle East. He was trying to say he was going to make things right, you know, Palestine, Israel, and all that. And uh, he was interviewed by uh, Al Arabia. Um, news and they said you know what can you offer that you know everyone every president has and it only gets worse you know the situation and he said um uh, well you know i um uh, i'm not a uh, i'm not a colonialist i'm a you know i'm a i'm free of that like because he's black. I mean, he's sort of saying, I'm a different person. And then he just went on and did the same thing, you know, that, that the others. Sorry, I should have turned my phone off. <laughs> um, so that, you know, that was, uh, uh, that was, I have, but that is in the book, you know, where he says yeah. it, uh, and, yes. you know, we, are we, not a we have a record. We, we have never been a colonial power. Yeah. And my comment in my book was uh, that that has to erase the first hundred years of U.S. history and the whole colonial period in order to make that claim. You know, I noticed that yeah. in the new introduction uh, that you had uh, had written about that, and you referenced uh, your the that inaugural address, the inaugural address of his first election, and right. and where he said that, and and it struck so close to home for me because I was there that day at the inauguration. I was in that crowd of a million people on the National Mall freezing really? I didn't know. yeah yeah i was there and and watching the jumbotron so you know we were so far away we were in front of the national museum of the american indian the N nmai and watched it from that perspective uh -huh. and with the jumbotrons and you know feeling it was such a hopeful time you know and so so much I optimism know. and then but then it was just oh my god Hearing that speech was such a letdown. Um, I was I was in I school at that time, and you know, hearing this, you know, from you know, black president, progressive president, um, but that invocation of the settler colonial narrative, um, and how you know, praising the you know brave intrepid pioneers and their wagons and blah 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 was just. Uh, it it was that was the moment, yeah. you know. It, that was that his was the inauguration speech. That was the inauguration speech, and I knew right then and there that nothing's going to change. Nothing's going to change mm -hmm. because he hasn't he hasn't kept up. You know, he's buying right into uh, right into the the colonial narrative and and upholding yeah. it. So yeah, I remember Jesse Jackson on a hot mic, you know, when he, uh, Obama was running for president, uh, said, um, you know, he's he's not a real black man. He's not a real Negro. And um, 
it was, you know, it was kind of embarrassing He's, uh, because it was on a hot mic. And it, it wasn't a public statement, but I thought, you know, it made me think at the time. I said, it's really true. He, he was raised by uh, a farming family from Kansas, you know, his mother. His grandparents raised him. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and then they sent him to... to uh, to college and um, his mother was an anthropologist. And so he really, he um, uh, he learned to be black, to be a politician from his wife, who was a Chicago, you know, definitely South Chicago, born and raised, a real, a real black person <laughs> descended from slavery. And that's very different, you know, because African immigrants who are coming, really some, you know, I have this in, in not a nation of immigrants, that um, they have written themselves, you know, how, how they look down on when they were settled, like Somalia settlers, settled in black communities, they were insulted because they said, you know, they didn't. Because in Africa, they don't think of themselves as black as unusual. Black is what e everyone is. And so they they felt superior, you know, and they themselves wrote, you know, lots in the uh, National New York Review of Books um, and different books that have come out of how African immigrants treated. And they were always treated better, even at the height of segregation. They could check into the hotel if they had an English, a British accent. They were treated like a royalty. Mm. Mm. So it wasn't just blackness, it was descendants of slavery. Yeah. Know, that, uh, is the is the thing that, that you're a slave, you know, forever. So Yeah. That's yeah. But with Obama, I mean, I don't want to belabor the point, but, uh, but but just to point out that he also grew up in Hawaii, which was an incredibly well, yeah. colonized space, right? Well, um, that that's where his grandparents moved to, you know, from Kansas. They moved to raise yeah. him, basically. Yeah, so he grew up in this place that, you know, he would have, you know, undoubtedly been exposed to well, he went to the, didn't he go to the Kamehameha School or, or Punahou or was it, was it Punahou he went to? Was one of those, um, it was a fairly elite school and uh, he. Oh, he, you know, yeah, he went to one of the, um, what are they called out in Southern California, down in Southern California. Uh, there's a, a, I don't remember what they're, I've spoken there many times, but he went to one of those elite um, schools, yeah. you know, really smart people, you know, I mean, they, yeah, they really, they, they have a, a way of, you know, uh, an innovative way of teaching um, that's more like the uh, British system, you know, Oxford and stuff. Mm -hmm. So he had a good education. Well, I think it's uh, 5.15, so it's time for... I think for, it's Q&A oh, time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we would love for folks to um, put questions in the question and answer box on the right-hand side while we're waiting for folks to put questions in. Um, I'm wondering if each of you could just offer maybe um, a, a book or... Um, a recommendation, you know, one of the things that we like to talk about at Keras is like, whose work are you in conversation with maybe across genres? Um, so are there novelists, fiction writers, poets who inform the work that you do? Well, for me, yes, I am a great fiction writer. I mean, fiction, not writer, uh, uh, fiction reader. Um, one of my favorite authors is Sigrid Nunez, who has a new book out, The Vulnerables. And my favorite book of hers is The Last of Her Kind, which came out uh, right before the pandemic, I think. I've read all of her books, and uh, I have uh, another favorite um, 
author I read, read recently is uh, the book, The Pole, and that's by um, uh, the South African writer uh, who won the, won the uh, Nobel Prize. <laughs> I can't think of his name now. J.D. Kutze. Kutze. He has a, has a uh, you know, an Africaner who's, you know, does not, did not like Afri Africaner uh, racism. So he's one of my favorite living writers. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I always have a novel going. Uh, and I, I appreciate poetry a lot. I was married to a poet for five years and uh, Simon Ortiz and got into the poetry world, you know, really, really admire uh, poets. You know, I think they're underappreciated uh, and usually not, they don't get rich off their books <laughs> by any means. So I, I'm sure you have a lot of great poetry there. I've been in the bookstore and I've seen it's such a great selection. Dina, do you have folks that are informing your work now? I'm so deep in research right now on these uh, two books. I've, I've got, got a deadline coming up. It's, uh, you know, and I, I will say that I'm, my next book is on Native American identity. And, uh, and, you know, we are in a moment right now uh, that's building, that's very contentious about what constitutes Native American identity. And there are, there are varying opinions. I'm gonna say that, I saw what was going on in the chat and I kind of feel like I wanna uh, say something about it because uh, some of what's being said is not fair. Uh, I don't agree with it. And uh, I'm an expert, uh, especially since I've got a book coming out about it. Um, I'm, you know, there's a, there's a, it's a very interesting history to trace the, the history of what's called pretendianism. Uh, and we can, we can, it's, it's a word that gets thrown around far too loosely. Uh, and I don't like it. Uh, and the term doesn't apply equally across, uh, across cases. And, um, and so it's been really interesting reading the history and it's taken me into film history, interestingly enough, because that's where we really see this phenomenon get born. Uh, and that really mm -hmm. has to do about, and I'd really, oh God, we could spend a lot of time on this, but uh, it really has taken me back to this era of the late 19th century uh, when forced assimilation is a policy in the US and the boarding schools uh, and um, and and I, it's really reshaped my thinking about uh, understanding assimilation as uh, assimilation to capitalism. And there's so little analysis of it in in those terms. And um, and it's the that that time period that comes into the early uh, you know to the to the first the Wild West shows and then and then the early film era where you see uh, this, this push, pushing of native people into uh, capitalism through the boarding schools and then later uh, the emergence of the film industry and, identify, and identity becomes commodified. And, uh, and that's a really interesting conversation. So I've been uh, you know, deep into, and I'm so not like a film scholar at all, but I've had to really uh, immerse myself in it, and it's been very enlightening. So uh, that's that's really what what I'm thinking about, and breathing, and eating, and sleeping right now. I love that, and I, you know, the the TV show Reservation Dogs has brought so much conversation about Native culture to mainstream. Ah. Uh, you know, you know, teenagers, and you know, all kinds of families are watching that show and and talking and learning about the different actors on the show and, and following their careers now. And um, that has been, I think, a really exciting um, thing. And so um, I think learning more through film history is pretty, um, is gonna be exciting. And we're, we're excited for your book. Um, you know, as we mentioned, 
at, at this moment, Atlanta is engaged in the Stop Cop City conversation. And I'm wondering more generally, um, y'all have both borne witness to many different activist movements. Um, and for folks who are young to activism, whether chronologically young or just uh, new to activism, are there maybe one or two lessons that you have taken around like strategies that you've seen people use that you you hope might get carried forward um, to a new generation? Um, thing, tools or ideas that you've observed from different movements that you've borne witness to? Yeah, well, I was so really, um, <clears throat> you know, the 60s, uh, so many people became activists and I was in, I was at UCLA in graduate school, uh, 64 to 68. And it wasn't, a, it wasn't a UC Berkeley, you know, they had had the free speech movement and all. We didn't, uh, ours was, you know, it's a very sedate white uh, university and, um, it took a while, you know, and there were just a few of us who were activists. Uh, one was uh, Mike Davis, who was an undergraduate at the time. But he was very fiery. I think he actually got uh, kicked out. <laughs> I can't remember for sure, but they were really harsh. You know, I, I just signed a petition against the war, uh, Vietnam War. And that petition got to the deans. They called me in. I was a graduate student. And I was a teaching assistant. And um, that was my income. You know, that's how I, li I lived off it. And he threatened to, you know, he, he said I had to take my name off that or go in my records permanently. And I said, well, okay. And I think it did hurt. You know, when I did graduate, it was uh, it was it was funny. You know how many jobs turned me down. You know, and I think Cal State Hayward when I went there, I think they got it later because they kept they tried to get rid of me, but I had the support of students. So it was you know it was um it was a tough time. You know, if you, to be an activist, you were you were definitely. Um, uh, you were definitely by the mainstream, you know, by the powers that be, uh, you, you were a renegade, an outlaw, you know, and, and a lot of people lost, um, uh, you know, ended up working in industry or, you know, getting driving trucks or whatever for jobs because, uh, because they were blacklisted and, it wasn't the kind of blacklisting of the 50s, you know, it was a lot more sophisticated, just a letter, you know, from a president. It wasn't the, it wasn't the, so much the federal government, although Nixon had his list, you know, for sure. And um, yeah, so I, but I uh, continued to be an activist. Um, I went from, the usual thing, the Vietnam War, and then the Vietnam War was over in 1975. But I was also involved in the women's, in um, starting the women's liberation movement when I was in Boston. And I actually went there to be more involved with the anti-war movement because it was centered there, Boston draft resistance and the New England resistance and um, ended up you know, starting a women's group that was very political. And it, uh, there are other women's groups forming, but our, ours was not, ours was also had the anti-war in it. You know, it was, I, I think, because of my own politics, uh, I, I wasn't, it wasn't just feminism, you know, it was feminism, um, anti-war feminism as well. So that was a huge movement. And uh, then, you know, uh, I, uh, I went and finished my PhD in 74 and became more of a, a, 
a an activist on campus, you know, as, as a professor, because so many of us, my generation, who did get jobs, usually at, you know, not not the best universities, um, we we were activists on campus and you know with various issues and campus issues, but also um, the Contra War, I got very involved in opposing the Contra War and traveling to Nicaragua in the 1980s. So I, you know, I've always been, and all the time I, I start, I got involved with the uh, uh, American Indian Movement uh, with when Vine Deloria asked me to be an expert witness for the uh, Wounded Knee uh, people, 300 misdemeanors and um, felonies and he uh, he and other lawyers had grouped it all together as one hearing to dismiss all of them at once and he wanted me to be an expert witness and I said I know nothing about it I admired it I watched it on television <laughs> but I I'm the wrong person and he says he gave me an armload of books and he said, I bet you're a quick learner though. You know, he wouldn't take no for an answer. So he made me into an expert witness and had me all, you know, doing all this stuff that I would never have imagined doing, uh, you know, Russell Bean's trial and I'm up there talking, you know, um, just telling the history. That's what they wanted me to do. You know, it's just tell the history. Uh, what what went on is pretty effective and so my then i i got involved in helping build the international indian treaty council to go to the uh the lakota elders um ask the the treaty council form the treaty council and ask the young people to go and explore uh the united nations so, that's what I did most of the 80s is UN work. Um, we built a, you know, now there's a, the largest meeting in the UN headquarters in New York um, ever. And now is the, is the indigenous peoples from all over the world that gather for uh, two weeks in uh, every April at the UN. And there are many, many other UN, you know, there's the UN Special Rapporteur and all these things. So that was my main activism, you know, in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and um, so I, you know, then I just started writing books. I got very sick uh, from getting pneumonia in uh, the jungles of Nicaragua several times. I, I got very ill. And... Uh, I realized that I, I couldn't be, uh, you know, active like I had been physically. And so I started uh, writing, writing, you know, uh, learning to write literary style and wrote three historical memoirs during the 90s. And, um, and then, you know, I really uh, kind of fell in love with, with writing. As a, as my activism in old age, <laughs> I love that. Or as a <laughs> we, senior, as we, <laughs> we we have a really good question. I want to make sure we have time to get to it. Um, uh, the the questioner asks, "What does reclaiming and contributing to indigenous epistemologies look like to y'all?" I'm an epidemiologist working in environmental intoxication. And our ancestors haven't faced the kinds of land poisoning we're seeing today because of European colonization of the planet. I'm curious about healing colonized consciousness to embrace and further indigenous epistemologies around land needs and care can help us to find ways to properly respond to the extreme damage we're seeing to earth and people. That's Dina's. Yes. <laughs> Oh, that's a long, big conversation. I can answer it in one sentence. And the sentence is, indigenous knowledge is the only hope for the future. Yeah. Because, it really is. yeah, indigenous epistemologies are uh, rooted in indigenous knowledge systems that 
uh, are fundamentally um, sustainable. And that's why they had societies that lasted for tens of thousands of years because they understood what it meant to live with the land, not, uh, not in domination, in a relationship of domination against it. And those are ontological problems. Those are philosophical problems. And, uh, and that I always say when I, because I give a lot of talks on this topic, uh, I always say that climate change and sustainability are not just conversations about economics or technology, they're conversations about philosophy and, uh, and, and values. And that's what indigenous knowledge has to teach the rest of the world. And without it, we're all, you know, it's, it's a pretty bleak future. So. No. A, a reminder for a shout out to to your book, um, because you know, folks folks may or may not. Uh, it is it has been a long bestseller at Karis, but as long as grass grows, um, it's a it is an important book. The Indigenous Fight for Environmental Justice from Colonization to Standing Rock. Um, that is a great book to get folks started. Uh, I suspect Bryn Davis may have already read it. Uh, if you're asking that question, you probably have a pretty strong base of knowledge. But um, just in case, check that out. Um, Watson, did you did you want to contribute anything? To well, that? I just add that there's also uh, part of um, uh, indigenous knowledge is the is the community is community because there's such individualism that we're you know capitalist system uh, we're to be little units economic units that perform to keep building it and um, that collectivity of people making decisions with you know discussing things and you you know one thing people can do you can't make the whole system do that uh, immediately but you can be in a group situation where you um uh respectfully you know disagree or agree, you know, and come to an intelligent uh, conclusion, which may be a compromise uh, of what you really thought, but it's a much more powerful way of acting than just simply on your own um, as an activist. So I think that there's a lot to learn from how Indigenous people have organized themselves and become, you know, the largest meeting in the United Nations every year from not being there at all. It was a very, just watching it, you know, was, I mean, to be able to be a part of that, but just watching uh, how that worked and uh, how so much of our power could come from that, you know, collectivity and respect mutual respect thank you so much i want to encourage folks if you don't yet own an indigenous people's history of the united states you can click the teal button at the bottom center of the screen to buy the new 10th anniversary edition um, you also of course can go back and buy all of the books that these two folks have written um, including the book that they co-wrote together um, there are so many it's a huge canon of work so um, we would love for you to explore all of it we also would certainly encourage you to request the book from your local public library. It's important that our public libraries know that these books are important to us. So um, if for whatever reason you discover that your library doesn't carry these books, kindly request that maybe they, they do. Um, these are important um, books for us to have access to and also for our young people to have access to. So they, particularly in Georgia, uh, where we are not being taught real history in our schools, uh, we really, really, really need to have access to real history in libraries. So um, consider donating a copy to a, a library or to a young person. Um, there is a young person's edition of this book as well, yeah. um, which is, uh, Debbie, Debbie Reese did the forward to it. Is that right? Or Debbie Reese? Uh, no, helped? Debbie Reese and Jean Mendoza uh, adapted it. Adapted it. Okay, great. And I refuse so, to have anything to do with it because they're the experts and they did. It's a really wonderful book. 
Okay, it's great. A young I need, people. I need to... It's not, you know, it's not dumbed down at all. It's really. Yes. Classic. We sell a lot of it. So um, that's another great one. If you have a young person in your life who is, is excited to learn history or um, we recommend that one too. So those and are all available also, from here. There's also a Spanish uh, uh, edition out of Madrid uh, that's available easily, you know, uh, in the United States. And I know there are a lot of Spanish speaking people in Georgia, especially, and of course, all over the country that and that's available as well. Wonderful. Thank you both so much for your time and all of your work and activism and writing. Um, it really does mean a lot to us that you spent your Saturday evening with us. So um, we really appreciate it. This event will be up on our um, Kara Circle YouTube page in a week or so. And we would love for folks who are watching uh, to share it with your friends. If there's folks who you wish could have seen this tonight, we'd love for them to catch the replay. Um, but thank you again. We really appreciate you both. You. Um, and hope to maybe see yeah. you in person sometime in the future. Yes. But until then... Yeah. Stay safe and well, and um, we look forward to future books. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to chat with you. I know. It's wonderful. Hope to see you soon. All right. Well, let's catch up again soon. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.